Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a terrific turnout for 6 o'clock. Um, I was just uh, telling Inga that uh, a couple of years ago I had a uh, quite a, a famous um, author named uh, Richard Ben Kramer here at 6 o'clock, and uh, I think there were probably about 40% fewer people than there are tonight, <laughs> so I would say that's a, a testament to your... Uh, to your draw. Uh, thank, thank you all for coming. Yeah, and yeah. the fact that we still have some uh, Philadelphia Inquirer readers in mm -hmm. town, and that's, the, that's great, too. Um, all right, so let me just uh, start off, say a couple things uh, for those who, uh, who I haven't met. I see some familiar faces. Uh, my name is Dick Pullman, and I teach in the writing program here, former colleague of Inga's at the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, and... Um, uh, I host uh, three or four guests per semester, and uh, Inga's one of them tonight. Uh, our, our show tonight is sponsored by uh, Creative Ventures, which is one of the uh, fine revenue streams we have here at the Kelly Writers House. <laughs> and I want to thank the Kelly Writers House also for uh, helping to uh, promote and, and uh, promote the event and give us our, our room here. Um, so what we're going to do here uh, is uh, I'm going to converse uh, with Inga uh, for the first part of our hour, uh, ask her some questions that uh, uh, I've got down here, and uh, have a conversation, which you will all then join, hopefully, uh, in the second part of our hour, questions and answers. Um, she'll be happy to take whatever you've got, I'm sure. Uh, but just by way of introduction, uh, Inga, of course, as you know, you wouldn't be here otherwise, is the architecture critic uh, for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, has been writing about design issues for uh, over a decade, I believe, uh, and likes to uh, focus, I think most interestingly, even though you do some, have done some uh, famous buildings uh, like Frank Gehry uh, and uh, the New York High Line, uh, you'd like to focus on people's, on the, uh, the urban scape of people's daily lives, the offices, casinos, and the parking garages and the parks um, here in Philadelphia. Uh, and I think what's interesting also is that uh, Inga has a long background as a reporter uh, covering all kinds of things, including uh, you were in Moscow as a foreign correspondent uh, back in the day. And so now you're bringing all these different uh, uh, talents to uh, being an architecture critic um, here in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, as you know, we have quite the... Uh, the scene here in Philadelphia with uh, the issue, urban issues and what our built environment is going to look like and trying to sort of uh, maintain our livability and distinctiveness uh, in the face of uh, homogenizing pressures that uh, we all know. And I think that's sort of uh, one of the pressure points that uh, Inga hits regularly in her column. Uh, she's also a, uh, a three-time finalist uh, for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and. Um, uh, that sounds like 0 for 3, but uh, as, as, I like, as I like to tell people who have been in this situation, I say that uh, Alfred Hitchcock and Cary Grant never won the Oscar, so it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, so just by way of that, I hope you all just welcome Inga to the Writer's House. Um, we, uh, we sat near each other in the Cherry Hill Bureau. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the Inquirer in 1990. You're, I date, think you're dating us. Yes, it's really kind of scary, but uh, you know, some people here are probably going to run, some of the younger people here will run terrified from the room after hearing that. Uh, but that's all by way of setting up my first question, which really is, uh, you were a reporter for years and years, and uh, it's an interesting transition to go from reporter to critic. And I'm just curious as to, you know, why did you, or maybe chose you, but why did you choose architecture? How did you make that transition? And was it a tough one? Yeah. Well, so since this is a conversation about craft, I'm going to, like, sort of tell you my life story because it, it sort of informs that answer. Um, you know, I didn't really, dis I'm one of these people who didn't really uh, figure out what I wanted to do in life until I was almost 40. Um, I, you know, I came up as a as a as a as a journalist, you know, sort of wanting to, you know, in the, in the Woodward and Bernstein age, and 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 um, wanting to emulate them. And you know, I thought, oh, I'll be an investigative reporter. You know, I'll start out as a, as a news writer. I'll become an investigative reporter. You know, and then, I'll, you know, the glory will come. And so I spent a lot of years uh, doing what 
uh, journey journey men, journey people, <laughs> reporters do is working in the suburbs, uh, covering school board meetings and planning commission meetings. And, you know, I was fine at that, and I wrote features, and I was okay at that, and I was really terrible as an investigative reporter. Um, and, and, and I also wanted to be a foreign correspondent. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to first be in Yugoslavia covering the war there and then in, in Moscow. But, and I was fine as a, as a foreign correspondent, but I wasn't a great foreign correspondent. So all these years I was just like trying to figure out what do I want to do and, you know, what can I do well? And through it all, through covering all those planning commission meetings in Cherry Hill, um, and in other places, and from being a foreign correspondent, I, I, I developed an interest in how, you know, we build our communities, the things we do right and the things we do wrong, and I got this idea that I could write about that as architecture critic. And so when I was coming back from Moscow uh, after doing a tour there, um, well, I, I, I like to tell this story because the Inquirer used to have six foreign bureaus, and it wasn't a huge foreign staff. And unlike, say, the New York Times, where you'd go from one foreign posting to another, after you, after you did your posting, you'd usually come back to the United States. And it was always a problem for the paper to figure out what to do with you. Because you know once you've been to Moscow or Jerusalem, you couldn't co cover Cherry Hill anymore. So um, when my tour was up in Moscow, uh, it just so happened that the previous architecture critic was leaving. And I volunteered for the job. And I think uh, the editors were so excited that there was a job nobody else wanted and I wanted to do it that they said, sure. And then after um, I got the job, they said, you know, you don't really have to do this if you don't want to. And I said, yeah, I, I, really, this, I do want to do this. Um, but anyway, I didn't know what I was getting into. And, but that is, that's sort of my long the long road to becoming an architecture critic. And, uh, and I had no idea. I had no idea what it was going to be like. Now, did you, okay, so you start off, um, did you take a period of time at all where you kind of schooled yourself in the particulars of Philadelphia and the development and architectural issues that were happening at that time? Or, as often happens in journalism, uh, did you just sort of jump into the deep end and mm -hmm. learn that way? Well, I, I think both, both things. I, by that time, I had lived in Philadelphia uh, on and off a good decade. So, you know, I'd been following the stories, in a, you know, just as a reader, even though I wasn't covering Philadelphia. Um, but I had studied architectural history in college, so you know I knew something. I in between foreign postings, I had actually been a home and design reporter, so I'd done some design writing. I'd filled in for the previous critic, um, Tom Hines. Uh, so I had done a little experimenting with that kind of writing, um, but I really had no idea, and I really do think I dove into the deep end. And if I had known what was involved, you know, it would have been too scary. But like a lot of reporters, I'm a generalist, and, um, you know, one day it's a murder, the next day it's, you know, the Comcast Tower, and you just roll with it. <laughs> so is it a different, okay, so there's a, clearly there's a different sensibility to being a critic than there is to being a reporter. You know, a reporter, if you're talking about kind of a more of a straightforward reporter, you know, you're reporting on what happened yesterday, mm -hmm. Or, or now in our world today, what happened today, uh, and you know, and holding back on your own point mm -hmm. of view, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's the objectivity, quote unquote. So a critic, you know, you're not a successful critic unless you have a point of view that you develop a voice. Mm -hmm. A reporter doesn't necessarily have a voice. Was that was that a was that a natural um, move for you? I mean, did it feel comfortable making that change, and was it hard to sort of get there? That was definitely something I had to learn because as a reporter, you are so schooled in objectivity. But, um, you know, there's no point writing a column or, or a review if you don't take a stand. And I had to really learn that and really push myself to do that. I'll just back up and say, I think there. You know, on, on newspapers and, and magazines that still have critics, and, and there aren't many of them. They could all fit in this room, probably. But those publications that have critics, there I think there are two kinds. 
there are people who come from the field, like you know maybe people who studied music, but chose to write about music, and they're deeply schooled in in everything about that field. And and then there are some people like me. I'm not the only one who was a generalist, who was a reporter, who uses the tools of reporters, you know, interviewing people, doing research, um, to learn everything possible about the subject at hand and reach some conclusions about it. And that's what I've learned to do. And I think that's my strength, actually, as a critic, is that I am a reporter. And I do call, you know, I might call 10 people and interview 10 people for a single review uh, to get, and I get all, you know, I think this is not typical either. I, I even get opposing review, uh, opposing points of view. You know, when I, I, I sort of wrote this sort of notorious review of a building called Symphony House, uh, in which I was very critical of that building, the developer, the architects. I spent four hours with them, and it wasn't pretty because they knew where I was going. But I do that for every review. And, and subsequently, when I reviewed buildings by that developer and that architect, I would call them up. And it's never very pleasant. But my belief is uh, you, know, you really can't understand a building or a project um, without talking to, peop to people who, who, who built it. And, and learning why they made certain decisions. Um, I, think it's, I think it's also a little different from like listening to, you know, you go to a concert, you listen to the concert, you judge it on what happened in that room, and you don't need any other information. But I think with architecture and cities and buildings, you need to know so much about the context, and that forces you to interview people. So I think for this particular kind of criticism, being a reporter you know, has served me well. And that, and that's, that brings up the broader question about having to deal with the people that, you know, before and after, the people that you may be criticizing their work. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, you know, it's a very personal, at least to them, kind of thing. It's not like, uh, you know, and we, we were kind of discussing this before, when you're a movie critic, say, you know, you're interviewing, you're, um, you're reviewing a Hollywood movie, the latest Hollywood movie, and you can sit there and you can go, you know, Steven Spielberg really hit rock bottom you know, yesterday, and you'll never meet Steven Spielberg, you'll never have anything to do with him, uh, and vice versa. Uh, but here, you know, these people are here, the local architects, the local developers, it's like, you know, they're, they're in your face, as it's, it were. It's brutal. Right? It's really brutal. Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, what... what you sometimes you run into yeah. them in the store. That's, that's the worst part. Oh, yeah, because you may not be, you know, dressed for work at that particular <laughs> moment, right? You know, you're in the Whole Foods or something. Uh, it's a small town. It's a really small town. Um, you know, you can slam Steven Spielberg. You don't even know if he read your review, but, you know, you slam Carl Dradoff or, <laughs> you know, you're going to run into him, and you're going to have to call him back and... Um, that's happened to me. And um, one thing I've learned, this is very heartening to me, is um, people love publicity so much that they always forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the just spell my name right kind of yeah, syndrome. Yeah, right? you know, they always come back because they're, you know, hope springs eternal. You'll like this, you'll like my next building. Uh, um, so, for those of you, some of you being here, maybe the younger people who don't know about the Symphony House. Um, it's a condo building on uh, South Broad Street uh, uh, near in Center City, which I think was actually, you know, at the time it was built, which was around 2007. Uh, Is that mm, when your review ran? I sounds, believe. Sounds about well, that's right. what I, that's what my research says. 2007. It was mm -hmm. one of the first, one of the, you know, it was a big mm -hmm. deal at the time because we weren't a lot of building wasn't going on, so a lot of ex hope and expectations went into the Symphony House. And for those of you who weren't around for that, uh, I have a couple quotes from your review. Um, the very first sentence called it the ugliest co new condo building in Philadelphia. And I think the sentence after that said that it looked, had the color and looked like a Pepto-Bismol bottle, <laughs> which I live a block from there, and I can attest that that's accurate as far as. Um, so tell, all right, so you know what the reaction's going to be. Uh, but uh, is it just part of, you know, is it part of your professional ethos to basically uh, be uh, stealing yourself? And, uh, I mean, do you develop a thick skin over time so that by the time you're writing things like that well into your career, it's easier to weather whatever comes next? Oh, yeah. I have a very thick skin. <laughs> um, 
one thing I should say about that is, um, so because I, have, I did come up as a reporter, um, one thing I do when I'm interviewing people, or, or, or rather, one thing I do when I go into a story is, uh, you know, if I meet with people, um, I, try, I try to keep somewhat of an open mind. You know, I haven't written the review in my head before I, before I meet with them. And I really work hard to elicit, you know, everything about why they decided to do what they did. So, because, especially with architecture, you know, there are constraints, uh, there are, you know, the conditions, something's built close to a subway, they can't do something because of, of um, the site. Um, so I want to know all that. I want to know what they were up against so I can evaluate, you know, what they did right and what they did wrong. So I, I do remember uh, in that case with Symphony House, I did spend four hours with them. I toured the building. Carl loves to show you every little detail of the building. He showed me the wine cellar. You know, um, I had a feeling I wouldn't like that building because I'd been watching it go up for a year and a half. But, you know, we, we f took this tour and finally I made them take me outside so we could look at the building from across the street. And, and I asked the question, you know, why is it pink? And Carl and his architect said, it's not pink, it's red. I said, it, lo it looks pink to me. <laughs> so we were having kind of this Monty Python-esque conversation. Uh, he insisted it was red, but, you know, at, and, and through all of this, I, I didn't say, I hate this building. I didn't say it's the ugliest building in Philadelphia because I, you know, um, Actually, a lot of times when I'm doing the interview, I don't even know what I think. I'm just gathering information. Be and and it, is, it is a very intense experience to be with these people doing these interviews, you know, and, and they're spinning you like crazy. And so, you know, very often, I don't know what I think. I'm just taking notes. And then when I get away from the people I'm, I've interviewed and I can sort of decompress, I sort of come to, to some determination about how I feel about this building, what do I want to say about it. You know, maybe I would interview some other people, uh, you know, who are more neutral or in, in this case a city agency was involved. There was a competition to build that building, so I would interview them about their decision making. So when you, when you, when you get a little space between the interview, between the people, you can you can determine what you're, what you're going to write and your point of view. And also, I find that if, you know, um, it's hard to say something about mean about someone you're with. <laughs> but once you're, you know, once you're away from them at your, all by yourself at your desk, it's a lot easier um, when they're not there with you. So, um, you know, that, that helps you sort of be brave. Um, right, because I, I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking about the writing process. Uh, and I'm sure it's different for, you know, I'm sure you, it's case by case. You have different moments when you really sort of come to your point of view. But I'm, I take it then that, so when you're writing one of these things, basically, it's just, and you mentioned at your desk, it's just basically you and the keyboard and your notes mm -hmm. and the screen mm -hmm. and nothing else. And that's all that interpersonal that, that's issues all, matters at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to separate because... Um, you know, I like these people. You know, they're they're characters in this big Philadelphia drama. Um, so it's not fun to say something negative about them. Um, I mean, so, sometimes it is fun to write a negative review. <laughs> I mean, either a negative review or a positive review. The least fun reviews are the ones that are kind of down the middle. Uh, they're pretty boring. But um, but yeah, you have to separate. Um, and how long, just roughly, I'm just curious, the people here who write uh, for a living or think about people who write for a living, how long does it take you to, to craft one of these reviews where I'm sure you want to make sure that you're speaking, particularly on something where the people are right in town, you want to write with a certain amount of precision and, and make sure that your stuff is backed up and contextualized and all that good stuff. Um, are we talking about four hours, two hours, all day? Oh, Dick, I'm a very slow writer. <laughs> um, so I'm on a kind of treadmill. I have a column that appears every Friday. And in an ideal world, I do one or, one or two or three stories a week. So for my column, which I do like to devote a lot of time to, if it's going to be a, a, 
a review of a single building is actually a little easier than some of the other kinds of reporting I do. But so if I'm reviewing a building, I'll look at it. Um, I will do some background research on the web or using books about the architect, the site. I might do some historical research about the site and what was there before. So all that will take a better part of a day. And then I would spend another day writing and brooding, and, and then I'll clean it up the morning of the third day. Do you write at home or do you write in the, in, in the newsroom with all the clamor? I, I write with the clamor, <laughs> but I have gotten a pair of headphones. Yeah. The, the, word, the word is from people I know that you wall yourself off mm. psychologically from everything that's going on mm. around you. I, I, um, often, like, I often think it's crazy. I mean, I don't know how we've come to this. We used to have cubicles with high partitions that at least kept out some of the noise. And in our new office, we have very low partitions. You know, So there'll be like a page design meeting going on like three feet from me. Um, there'll be, you know, people having a nervous breakdown <laughs> on the other side. A lot of that right now. Um, you know, people talking on the phone. Um, you know, it's one thing, I, you know, in the old days of newspapers, you know, when you were just banging out a story about a fire or a murder, which was in a kind of um, fixed pyramidal style, like it was one thing to have all that chaos around you when you're trying to write something more sophisticated and nuanced. It's, it's really crazy. Do you ever tip off, uh, tip off, maybe not the right word, do you ever signal um, in advance of the uh, piece being posted or published uh, to, um, to a developer or an architect that a negative review is coming? Or I never do that. I never say that explicitly. Um, you know, they might infer from my questions that it might be negative, but real so often um, because of the spin is so intense, I I don't know what I think till I get away away from it. That's one thing, um, and and I do try to be neutral in the questioning. And actually, sometimes I know no one believes this, but I'll go in thinking, well, I don't really like this, but I'll actually come out. Uh, more positive than I expected because you you learn things, um, but no, I never I never tip them off. I never say bad reviews coming. I, this is, you know, I think this comes from you know old reporter tradition. You never tell people what you're going to write. You never read them your quotes. You never read them your stories. Um, you never tell them what your opinion is, um, and I that's just an old habit of mine. So okay, so there will be. Um, we don't want to necessarily leave the impression. For those of you who haven't read a lot of English stuff, or I'm sure many of you have, um, that you're just out there writing negative reviews all the time and firing away mm -hmm. at everything, because quite the contrary. Just recently, you wrote a um, you wrote a really um, um, up review mm -hmm. of the new uh, Sing Center. Yes, I was. At Penn. Yes, it's a wonderful building, um, and I was very very positive about it. And um, you know, it's a great joy to me actually to find a good building in Philadelphia. You know, we have. We're very conservative city, so things kind of just there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of meh and boring, um, and that's that's hard to write about. As I said, uh, it's not terrible, it's not great. Um, so finding a good building, and there have been a, a couple of really real standouts over the last years, is really exciting and and thrilling for me. It's like you know. I think for anyone to discover a great book or a great artist, you know, it's just, it's so exhilarating. And so this building, which is at uh, 33rd and Walnut, the new nanotech building, uh, it's by quite, quite well-known architects. I knew their work. Um, I'd seen the, I'd seen the plans. Uh, I didn't get to write about it in the design phase, but I was very, very excited to see it. And, and, you know, I think I think it, it's it's beautiful and um, uh, it's so exciting that the city can produce something like this. I just I just wish we saw that more in the public realm and not on university campuses. Yeah. Uh, so you had a fairly when you went to do the actual, you know, f on the on the scene uh, part of your reporting, you had a fairly good feeling about that. Up right. Front, right. Because right. you, you know yeah. buildings take so long to go up. Yeah. I mean. If you go to a movie to review it, you haven't seen it. Maybe you've seen the trailer. With buildings, you know, they take a, 
a year and a half or two years to go up. So you're watching it go up, and you you know you can't help but form some sense of what it's going to be. So I saw this building going up. I'd seen the the renderings. Um, I had some idea what it was going to be, but you know I think I think the uh, the final judgment is made on the experience of the place, and I do this a lot. Um, I walk through the buildings. Um, I, I, I try to spend time there at different times of day, see how the light changes. Um, another thing I do, which I, I forgot to mention, because uh, the spin is so intense, when you're be, you, in order to review a building, you have to be given a tour, generally, uh, if, you know, if it's just opening or um, if, if access is, is, is somehow controlled. So you have to be given a tour by you know, people who have a stake in it. And of course, and they, you know, they want you to say good things and they will spin you like crazy. So what I like to do is after that very intense experience is go back quietly on my own, even if I can't get inside, and just see it privately with nobody talking in my ear and telling me what to think. Um, you know, and I did that with the thing uh, I was able to get inside again and just walk walk the halls by myself and uh, with no one talking to me. You see, you also had a few nice things to say, uh, or I think about, and this is very preliminary because there hasn't even been there hasn't even been ground broken yet. But where the cheesecake factory oh, building yeah. is going to be at Fifteenth and Walnut, mm -hmm. and isn't that the same architect that did uh, the, the Apple store? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so uh, that's something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very excited about that story. Um, it's become a more competitive world. There's a lot of blogs and websites that write about what I write about, and 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 they're a lot more nimble, unfortunately, than the Inquirer. But uh, this Cheesecake Factory had been, you know, rumored to be coming to Philadelphia for a long time, but no one had seen the plans. And um, when I heard it was that uh, this architect, our local architecture firm called Bolin Sawinski Jackson, which had it's a big firm with offices in different cities, and so they designed the prototype for the Apple stores. They did the one uh, in New York um, at, at General Motors Plaza on Fifth Avenue. Um, so when I heard they were doing it, I was very, very excited to see what they would come up with because, you know, it, do it doesn't compute. You know, if you think of the Cheesecake Factory <laughs> and what those restaurants look like, uh, they're almost always some kind of cheap stucco, kind of yellowish on the highway. And then you think about how pristine and, and um, exquisite the Apple stores are. It just didn't compute. So, you know, this again comes from being a reporter. My news sense said, this is going to be a great story because it was really a man bites dog story. And so I, I got on the phone and I pushed them to show me the plans. And, um, you know, they were a little nervous, um, but uh, I called the developer who I'd interviewed years ago, and he re and, and I fortunately said something nice about him. And he remembered me, and I, I really had a sweet talk them into letting me see the plans, and as soon as I saw them, I was practically jumping up and down, because it is so rare uh, to see a good building, and um, an interesting building in Philadelphia. And it's even rarer to see one that's not an institution, a, a museum, or a concert hall, or a university building. So to have a private development be so good, um, it was unusual in many different ways. Nobody builds small commercial buildings anymore. You know, everything is, f you know, a formula um, done by chains. And so here was a small developer committed to quality, hired a good firm, gave them a long leash, let them do what they want, and they produced just, you know, an exquisite building. It hasn't been built yet, unfortunately. Yeah, well, actually, and some of you who are around 15th and Walnut may wonder exactly what I'm about to say to you, which is why haven't they cleared the ground to build it yet? What's taking so long? Well, to their credit, I think they have, you know, it's a, it's a multi-tenant building. I think they will, there will be uh, three retailers and some offices. And I, apparently, um, it takes a long time to sign these leases with these big chains. And the negotiations are really difficult. And, um, you know, because they're going to sign a lease for 25 years or whatever it is. So I think the developer hasn't actually, they've gotten verbal commitments, maybe something beyond that, but they haven't pinned down all the leases. And to build this building, they will actually have to knock down three 
nice, but, you know, run down and not significant existing buildings. And I think they're being very cautious. They don't want to tear down those buildings uh, until they're absolutely certain that they're going to have tenants to occupy this new building. And I think also there are cost issues and, you know, um, the famous phrase uh, developers use is, we have to make the numbers work. And, and I think even a, a good developer like this who is committed to quality, he doesn't want to lose his shirt. So, um, you know, if the price of steel is too high or glass, they have to alter the design. So I think there's a lot that goes into it. But um, I give them credit for, I mean, there's some developers who would just like raise that corner, bef you know, and knock those buildings down before, you know, everything was signed on the dotted line. You know, you mentioned blogs and, and new, the new media mm -hmm. stuff a second ago. And, and this, I would think this would be something that you think about a lot. You know, where you have the proliferation of blogs doing the kind of stuff that you do. I mean, I'm thinking of um, uh, Plan, Plan Philly, Philly, maybe Hidden City, mm -hmm. Naked Philly, oh, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. All it, of those. I mean, you know, I mean, how do you, <laughs> I mean, this is something that journalists mm -hmm. in general, or, or certainly political journalists, which is more my realm, mm -hmm. they're all struggling with this. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, you got the blogs, you got those websites devoted to urbanism and architecture. Has it changed at all your approach to to criticism, or is it is it just about defending your territory? I mean, how do you? And you mentioned one thing, just being a good reporter and getting out ahead on that story. But mm -hmm. are there other things that has it changed the rhythm of what you do or the way you approach yeah, your work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, in a way, it's really great. You know, um, when I started out, I felt like I was the only voice uh, in the city writing about these issues independently. Um, and in some ways, that's great for a reporter. You never have to worry that someone's like breathing down your neck. You can like organize your schedule <laughs> at your convenience. Now suddenly, there must be ten different websites uh, that are interested in the kind of urban issues that I am. They're interested in getting plans because that's you know you get a lot of eyes and a lot of clicks, and that matters. Um, just quickly putting up an image and. So the Inquirer is not a very nimble organization. Uh, just just before I left here, I wrote a blog post, and um, uh, I could I was having some technical trouble. But the manager of the website was on furlough. The second person was not scheduled to work today. Um, I wandered around the office trying to get some technical help. There was nobody who could fix it, and so I left the office without posting it. You know, I can't be nimble. All these people can be really nimble. They have very simple sites. They can post things super quick. And uh, they write very short. And they just kind of tell you generally what it is that they're showing you a picture of. So it's incredibly frustrating for me. Uh, on one hand, I could do the same thing. You know, I could have I could have a blog if I could figure out the technical parts <laughs> of the Inquirer website. <laughs> I could just post a lot of pictures, write two paragraphs, and be done with it. But um, and and not get beat, which I'm getting beat all the time now. Um, on the other hand, so I've sort of come to the decision, at least this week, that I can, if I can't beat them, I could do it smarter. This is this is my strategy now. <laughs> is um, my value added is that I've, I have a deep knowledge of this subject in Philadelphia. Um, I have a frame of reference for, you know, evaluating these things. And um, by waiting, I can uh, give a fuller picture of what does it mean. I can tell you, I, I don't just tell you this is being built. I can tell you everything about what it means that it's being built and what are the issues and what are what what are the stumbling blocks and how you know and include and actually do reporting um, and so that's my thinking right now that that's more valuable and even if I'm not first I can be best uh, at least that I, you know I'm trying that approach <laughs> but I worry about it all the time and it makes me crazy. Um, because I just I can't match them. There's also there are also more people than me. It's me against you know a, a dozen other reporters. I was going to ask if you were blogging more, but you just kind of answered that question. If the technical people aren't helping you do it, how do you blog more? Yeah, the blog. Um, I mean, 
in a perfect world, I think I would I would have one site in which I put short posts and long posts, a very simple site. Um, but um, another reason the Inquirer isn't nimble is because we're producing multiple products. We're producing a paper product, and I have to I I'm supposed to file on Tuesday for Friday, and I. You know, it's very, because there's this whole cumbersome production of the paper. Um, so that interferes, that long lead time interferes with being nimble and, and, and filing quickly because, you know, I couldn't, there was a story I wanted to cover yesterday, but I couldn't do it because I was on deadline for my Friday column. Even though I could have written the story for today's paper, the, more of a news story, um, I had to, to concentrate on meeting my deadline for Friday. So what about, uh, I have to ask the one question about Twitter, <laughs> uh, which some of you are probably on Twitter or following it and some of you are not. Uh, but um, there's also, I know, within journalism, and, and this is probably no different for you, you know, great pressure to do those 140-character messages all day long uh and i know you're on twitter i love twitter uh, and uh, uh, I, love, <laughs> I, I admit it i love twitter too uh and it can be really compulsive mm. uh how often are you doing that and are you finding ways to leverage it to your advantage you know it's, it's hard to, to to measure what you're getting out of it um except your number of followers um uh, you know i you asked me a moment ago do i blog Mm -hmm. and, and the blogging had all these problems, you know, it was always a tension between do I write this for the paper or do I write this for the, for, for, for the blog? And, you know, even to write a blog, you have to check your facts, you have to do reporting, it's a lot of work. Writing a tweet is so easy <laughs> and so fast, and um, I really like that. I find it, it's a lot easier than blogging, and you can actually convey a lot of information you can, you know, uh, you could, I love doing like mini reviews, you know, of things. Um, and you can include pictures and there's no bureaucracy, no editors. Um, it's great. Um, so I really like that. And, and, and I'm embarrassed to say, you know, there are probably some days I tweet 10 times. I mean, a lot of it is links. Um, but um, every time I tweet someone else's link I try to and I only tweet st stuff about my subject I don't tweet any personal stuff I don't I very rarely treat any tweet any uh, non-architecture non-urbanism related stuff um, but when I tweet someone's link I try to make I, I try to take ownership of it I, I tr you know if I'm tweeting a story from the times I try to give my perspective on that story so what do I get out of it um, I have been contacted about some jobs, um, which is nice. And, um, you know, I think, I, I, I know that my, my stuff is being read around the world. And that's, that's a pretty heady thing, because I tweet all my stories. And, and, you know, you can do this map of your Twitter followers, and it's very cool to see, you know, followers in Asia, and I even have followers in Africa, and you know, and I see I see them talking about my stories, and that's a really exciting and heady thing. Um, you know, the idea that you can write locally and be read globally, and and Twitter just helps that happen. Yeah, you know, the the internet's kind of like twisting journalism in knots, but by the same token, it's, the transparency of it allows people locally or in places like Philadelphia to be able to reach people that the print paper. Mm -hmm. You never reach them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, and so many younger people don't look at the print paper and they're only seeing my stories because they're on t Twitter and they're right. following me. Um, but um, just maybe I'll give one example. I, I wrote a story recently actually about a project in West Philadelphia in Spruce Hill neighborhood. And it was an unusual project because the developer showed up to meet with the neighborhood and he didn't bring a PowerPoint, he didn't bring any plans. Um, he, he said, listen, um, you know, the zoning for this site is all wrong. I want to do something more ambitious. 
um, I don't want you to tell me you're opposed to that. I want you to tell me what you're for. And then he held a series of what we call charrettes, which are sort of like brainstorming sessions, where the neighborhood helped craft some general outlines about the project that they uh, wanted to see on the site, which is right across from Clark Park. And I thought it was so innovative and progressive and interesting that I, I wrote a story about the process, um, a column about the process. And boy, that story was picked up and read in cities around the US and Canada. And people were incredibly interested in this developer and his approach. And I think it was useful to those, you know, neighborhoods in Toronto and uh, Portland, you know, just to, to hear about a developer doing things this way. And I, think, I would think it was meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. the, only, and the other thing before we, we're going to go to questions in a second, so I hope everybody here was so uh, good enough to come. Um, I hope you have some questions for Inga. Uh, the only other thing I was curious about was um, we were talking about being smarter than the competition and maybe having giving the fuller picture than the competition. One way you've, you, I know you've done is you sort of expand out the concept of what an architecture critic does, as in you cover scandals like involving the family court mm -hmm. building, which where uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Ron Castile mm -hmm. got caught mm -hmm. up in that. Uh, and so, you know, you do stuff like that. You do a city development policy. Um, so, I, I mean, in a way, it's like I wonder, you know, why, why call yourself an architecture critic when you're sort of, when, you, when you're doing it that broadly? Yeah. You know, if I were just writing about the aesthetics of buildings, I don't think I would have a job on a daily newspaper because um, sadly there's limited interest in the, you know, the pure aesthetics of our surroundings and architectural ideas, but there's a huge interest in how we construct our communities, um, what we build, um, what we don't build, um, the forms that we build in, and um, I kind of knew this going in, and of course, I, I actually came from, from you know, that kind of sensibility as, as well. Um, and I think, again, starting as a reporter, it, it really lends, my, it lends itself to writing about, well, you know, how did that corner get so bad that you can't even cross the street there? Or um, how did that really ugly building get get built and 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 you you mentioned um the family court saga um you know that that's a an interesting story because i had got i had been hearing about this new courthouse that was being built and i um was tr again trying to to wrest the designs from from the people involved and i had to go to a, a city art commission meeting to actually see it because they wouldn't give me the designs and, you know, in Philadelphia, everything is a deal. I mean, you can't not tell that part of the story because the reason so many of our public buildings are so bad is because of uh, the deal making and the pay to play. And, you know, just to criticize the design, you know, and say it's not attractive or it doesn't live up to these kind of architectural theories doesn't really help people understand how it got to be like that. Anyway, so I went to this art commission meeting. I saw them just kind of, actually the art commission, I think even they were shocked by it, but they did approve it. And then afterwards I was interviewing the attorney um, who had represented the, the uh, state, the courts, the state Supreme Court. And in that conversation, I was asking him, you know, how they found the site, how they found the architect. And in the course of the conversation, it came out that he was representing both the state Supreme Court and the developer, both sides of the project. And you know, my report, the light bulb went off of my reporter's head. This is not right. Um, <laughs> it ended up being a huge scandal. And um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of those stories. I wrote like five columns about you know how this is you know the source of so much of our our bad design and bad urbanism. Um, other reporters wrote terrific investigative pieces, um, and um, Castile almost lost his job. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that keeps you going in this business, <laughs> right? Oh you. yeah, seriously. Um, and on that note, let's get some uh, some questions. Anybody? Yes, sir. How do you feel about a second casino in uh, Philadelphia, and whether or not it should be on Broad Street? 
or down by the uh, athletic facilities, which has a different kind of a crowd than mm -hmm. you might get. Mm -hmm. uh, and do we need a second casino in Philadelphia? Well, we don't need a second casino. We don't even need a first casino. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I really don't like gambling. I think it's a very regressive way um, for the state to raise money. You know, what I, what I always say that, you know, our governments are no longer capable of taxing people, so we have to have the casinos do it for us. Um, it's a really sad state of affairs. So I'm opposed to uh, casinos, but uh, like many people here, I'm beaten down because, you know, it's a reality on the ground. So um, I think if you're going to do it, you should do it in the way that leverages the casino building to create other kinds of development, retail, hotel. And, um, you know, when I was writing about the first casino, which I wrote about a lot, you know, I had argued at that time for a downtown location, and, you know, people told me I was nuts. Um, and, of course, they, they picked the waterfront. Now, again, and, and I think, and it's really interesting to me to see sort of the public opinion or the, uh, the opinion of the, of the city elite come around, because now there are two essentially downtown proposals, one in the old Inquirer building and one at 8th and Market. Um, so I've written that um, I think those are the best sites because, you know, I feel, well, one, they're more accessible to public transit. That means you don't have to build a giant, as, as giant a garage, which is often the worst part of a project. Uh, two, there's a possibility of retail. Um, in both cases, the casino would be on the second floor, and so the first floor could have other stuff, especially on Market Street. You can imagine retail, restaurants. Um, and, you know, I, I just think they won't be gambling-dominated. I really oppose um, casinos on the riverfront because... Um, there, you know, cas ca the casino industry, like a lot of industries, ha has has very strict formulas. You know, they have a formula. I think it's um, three parking spaces for every slot machine, or something like that. I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact formula. So, and we have a state that requires, in an ultimate build out, five thousand slot machines. Um, so. Maybe it's one, one parking space for every, every slot, whatever. So, so there's this mandate to have this giant, giant parking garage. Why would you want to build a, par a giant parking garage on the river? The parking garage that's now being built for Sugar House will be one of the tallest buildings on the riverfront. It's a terrible, terrible place for parking. Why are we destroying our riverfront by building giant parking garages? So the current, the only current proposal for the riverfront is Steve Wynn's casino, uh, which I have slammed in a column. It's unbelievable. Steve Wynn, Wynn does not believe in multiple level parking garages. So instead he would build w a one story parking garage. It would, uh, it would cut, it would roof over 20 acres. I'm not making that number up. It, and, he, and the design that he loves, the casino, so you'd have this 20 acre, one story building, like a giant warehouse. And in the, the, the casino itself would be in the center. And there would all be all these radiating corridors that lead to the casino, which of course would have no windows. It would be the same plan as the prison on Fairmount <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> I just think that is horrible. I mean, I don't know which is worth, a seven-story parking garage or, or a 20-acre, one-story parking garage, but they shouldn't be on the river. So I discount that one. And then there are three more that are proposed near the sports stadium, basically right over the Walt Women Bridge. You know, So you'll get these people from Jersey or maybe Delaware County like zipping, zipping down the highways to the casinos and leaving and not spending any more money except in the casinos. That's one problem. Two on those really heavy traffic days at the Eagles game or the Phillies game, you, you know, you, you add in the mix some casino traffic. Um, I just don't think you get any real benefit. By the only benefit you get by putting it near the sports stadium, and, and I, I could almost be convinced of this, is that it would be so out of the way, we wouldn't notice it. So that's the great advantage to those casinos. But Otherwise, you know, my money right now is on the, um, 
the two downtown ones. And the city has actually sort of said that those are its favorite casinos. Along, They've also put win on that list. I don't know why. Did you know that the uh, photo that was used on the web, excuse me, did you know that the photo that was used on the uh, uh, website of the uh, 15th Street project was flipped? It showed it as if it was the northeast corner, uh, southeast, the northeast corner rather than southeast. But that's uh, near the here, the rare. Do you know that the third building in has the same second floor trim as the fourth building, the next door building to it, which is not going to be destroyed? How will the architect incorporate that trim in such a way that not to destroy the fourth building? Well, I didn't really talk to them about that. I think, I mean, there are a number of buildings that have, in Philadelphia that have been sliced up, you know, sa sadly, and I think you can make it look good. I'm hope I, I think they're very um, responsible architects. They not only they did the Apple Store on Walnut Street. They did a very good job. They also did a a renovation, a really nice renovation of what used to be um, was it? It was the KYW, the original KYW building. Do you remember that building that used to have all those black panels on it, no windows, and they they it was it was a TV station that was and and they took the panels off and they put in windows and they did just a you know, it's a really fine, thoughtful job. And so um, maybe I'm naive, but I kind of trust them to do the right thing. Yes, sir. I will, we'll get, try to get is everybody. There, uh, is there a um, regional or national organization of architecture critics? And uh, if there is... Uh, do they have standards? Do, they have, uh, <laughs> do you relate to them? That's a good question. So, so um, I think the number of architecture critics in this country could, we wouldn't fill this room. There are very, very few actual critics. Although there are more, a lot more architecture writers than there used to be. Um, there's um, two organizations. Uh, one is the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy, which is a, a think tank in Cambridge. Uh, Massachusetts, and then there's um, uh, Rockefeller Brothers Foundation in New York, and they organize annual conventions of, of the critics. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> they just like us. They, they, they you know, they uh, pay for us to get together, have a little convention, and talk about our profession, and, and we've gradually come to include a lot of other people real estate writers and uh, bloggers and, and that sort of thing. But um, no, there are no standards, there's no organization. It's, it's a really small ad hoc group. And you know, there are no, I mean, yeah, there are organizations for journalists, um, like, uh, what is it called, like the, I mean, uh, of course. There's the, three or four of them. Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, are there any, do we have any official standards? <laughs> <laughs> it's very, you know. Truth, justice, in the American. I mean, way I think in a democracy, like you know, there's no one who officially stamps you as a journalist. And in fact, the, you know, of course, now with uh, you know with blogs and 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 Twitter and Instagram and all those other things, you know, the the whole definition of journalist is getting mm. more and more fungible. Right. You know? Oh yeah. Isn't there a woman in prison um, who's um, yes. been asked to turn over her notes? for a story she was working on, but she she's um, refusing to do that. The government says she's not a journalist. Right, right. And uh, Congress is trying, Congress is proposing a media shield law mm -hmm. right now. It's in Congress somewhere, but they can't figure out, they can't work, get the wording right on how to define mm -hmm. journalist because it, it keeps changing. I it think it's opening. pretty treacherous territory, so. Let's, uh, let's go see somebody, one of those, you folks in the back. And, I, would you please talk about deconstruction in Philadelphia? We've had a horrible scandal at 22nd and Market, and uh, there's a lot behind that. Oh, oh yeah. Um, you mean demolition of, of buildings. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, this is a big old city uh, with... Um, a lot of buildings. The city government is um, is not a not very efficient, and and b 
not very good at keeping track of all this stuff and um and you know there's still a lot of corrupt pockets to the city government so um there's also a climate in the city of uh, we're we're desperate let's build at any cost and not worry about the details that's how a lot of really terrible projects get approved so in that case where the, this is the salvation army that collapsed and killed six people um, the city had just kind of signed off on the demolition permit that, and um, there was almost no oversight and um, you know this has been going on for years that owner was responsible for another death uh, he was the executor for the notorious Rappaport estate which is he was a kind of a slumlord he just you know accumulated hundreds of buildings and and you know sat on them hoping to make for a big payday um, when this guy became the executor for the estate he didn't do anything to repair them and and a, a city judge was killed when a piece of the building fell off it so the city has a terrible terrible record a at policing those things um, but certainly this you know was a revelation about just how how bad uh, the procedures are. The city has introduced new, stricter procedures, um, but um, I don't know if they're willing to spend the money. Um, spend the money on enforcement? To, on enforcement, yeah. Yeah. Way back, and then we'll get you guys here. I wonder if you would comment on the granary building, uh, specifically the granary building itself. Um, you mean the old granary or yeah. the, the new granary? Well, the new one seems to be finished, but there's still that old, tall building, which I think you wrote a column about. Yeah, a I love that building. I, I, yeah. Tell folks where the, we're this granary building is, um, let's see, it's, at, it's just 20th Street north of Callow Hill. Um, there used to be a rail line that a uh, freight rail that came into the city there and and all the city's grain or a lot of the city's grain was stored in this building and it's kind of it's a weird building because there are no windows for the you know first 10 it's like 12 stories or something like that and there are no windows for the first 10 and it has kind of this crenellated castle like top um, it's uh, one of the few industrial buildings that's listed on the city's historic register um, it's it's you know quite a, a landmark. You can see it from pretty far away. I I I like it. And uh, in the seventies or eighties, some kind of crazy interior designer bought it for a song. And um, the upper floors where the windows are were were the offices of the granary. And he 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 created a spectacular couple of apartments and would hold fabulous parties there. So it actually was repurposed. But then he sold it. Um, there was an architecture firm in there, they moved out. The developer bought it and um, wanted to do some really crazy things to it. I don't think he was serious. He proposed building another tower on top of it. It was, it was kind of nuts. It, 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 it probably would have cost too much. Um, so it's just sitting there. I don't know what he's going to do with it. But meanwhile, when he, he was um, not permitted to do that, to, to change the character of the historic building, he, he owned a, a big surface lot in front of it um, on Callow Hill facing the back of the, of the free library. And he's built um, a mid-rise building. It's seven or eight stories. And it's unusual because uh, the materials are like corrugated metal and um, some other things we don't traditionally build with in Philadelphia. And you know, I had my doubts about it in the beginning, but I think it actually came out really, really good. And I think it's a great building for that location um, because, you know, and, you know, often I will, I don't expect everything uh, to be a work of art, every building to be a work of art. What I do expect every building in the city to be is, is a good urban neighbor, to have ground floor retail, to have, uh, transparency and permeability to be friendly to people walking down the street um, to make a place and this building does all those things it's lined with stores and restaurants it has a lot of windows um, it really fills the site in an urban way and um, I really like it and I would like to write about it 
I think the developer's a little mad cause, at me because he won't call me back, but um, <laughs> I will write about it. <laughs> you had a question, didn't you? I have a yeah. ton of questions, but I'll, I'll narrow it down <laughs> to three. Um, my first one is, I have to admit, I imagine you sitting at like a postmodern, I mean, a, a mid-century desk in like a <laughs> loft every day. So I have to ask why you choose the uh, newsroom. Uh, my second question is going to be, um, have you ever, what has been, if you've had one, your favorite discovery about Philadelphia architecture, mm -hmm. something from your past? And my third one is, uh, will you ever consider having Instagram? Because I would love to see the. I do do Instagram, oh, okay. not 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 That's very, uh, not enough. Okay, it's hard to. There are too many social medias. I'm, I'm draw. I, I like Instagram, but um, it's easier to do it on Twitter. <laughs> um, so why do I work in the office? Because even in this day and age your editors get very nervous if you're not in your in their sights. <laughs> so it's just, you know, especially if you're late, if you're late with your story and they're freaking out and they can see you're working. Um, so that's why I do, I mean, sometimes I do work at home. Um, and after today, I thought I will always work at home. But um, I don't know, it's, it makes them happy. <laughs> so, um, I need to buy better head, head, headphones, though. Um, so what is the discovery? What is the building discovery? Um, hmm. Anything that gave you tingles or was just like a really, like, fun yeah, yeah. Well, this Cheesecake Factory was a big surprise to me, um, a nice surprise. Um, I'll try to think of the answer. I'm, I'm not good at those Down, right questions. down in front here. And then we'll, there's one way back there, two, two. Thank you for writing provocatively over these many years. Um, I'd like to get back to the question that you raised about rivers and riverfronts. Do you have any preliminary thoughts on the boardwalk going up on the school kill right now? Uh, yeah, I, I do have preliminary thoughts. I know I said I don't form opinions beforehand, but <laughs> I guess I do. I mean, I, I, you know, you know, I live in the city. I can't. Just like everybody else, every time I walk by a building, I, I, I think, well, how do I like it? You know, how does it make me feel? So yes, I, I, I'm watching this boardwalk. I've been watching it with a lot of trepidation and trying to figure out, you know, when I write about it, how I'm going to write about it. Um, so in case you've never been there, over the last decade, the city has developed a really wonderful riverfront park uh, along the Schuylkill River. Um, it's been kind of miraculous because it's actually pretty bare bones, but um, and it almost didn't get built. And but it's become incredibly well used. Um, and on a beautiful spring day or fall day, it is just packed with runners and bikers and people wh wheeling strollers and um, people walking, and um, it's not wide enough. I would say it is overused. And um, unfortunately, the strip of land that it occupies is really narrow, and there are some choke points that prevent the path from being widened. The path there is, I think, um, 10 feet. I, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the numbers. The path, the path on land is about 10 feet. The boardwalk's about 15. But the, on, on land, at least, there's a shoulder, right? So if you're about to have a collision between a bicycle and a skateboarder or whatever, you can always go off onto the shoulder. Once they're on that boardwalk, there is no shoulder. And, you know, I, I am very worried about... Um, those kinds of collisions and, and, and what will happen. Um, the Schuylkill River Development Corporation, which is building it, and I've talked to them about this over and over again because I am kind of obsessed about it. They say, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, but um, I'm worried. So we'll see. Um, the reason they built it that way is because there, there wasn't enough land. And there are a lot of... Um, so, so there's a train, uh, the CSX freight train, uh, that their line and their right of way separates, you know, the edge of the city from the waterfront. And so, in that little area, there wasn't enough of an edge or enough of a stable edge for them to extend the path on land. And um, the, the Federal Army Corps of Engineers has very strict laws about landfilling, so they couldn't even add land. 
Uh, and so that forced them to do the bo boardwalk. So I guess, you know, t you know, to support their point of view is, you know, if they want to extend the path, which I think is a great idea, this was the only solution. So we'll see how it works. I mean, maybe people will be good citizens and they'll walk their bikes and, and be slower. We have, uh, I promise you guys back there. One back there and then, and then you. Um, hi, I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, the usage of the viaduct and if you think that the um, sort of proposed High Line-esque um, park is a good idea or if that um, already pre-existing infrastructure could be put to better use. What was the last part of that? Um, if the pre-existing infrastructure could be put to better use. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't think there's any other use for that viaduct other than a park or just let, leaving it as is. I mean, I, I don't know if you've been up there, but I, it's, it's a spectacular, spectacular venue. The views of the city are just amazing. And um, it's all overgrown and wild. And it's, it's pretty fun and exciting exactly the way it is, but um, not really safe or accessible to people. I, I think it would make a great park, um, a really great park. And I think it would um, enliven that little quadrant north of Center City and bring development just as the High Line has in New York. I mean, we're not New York and, it, you know, the High Line in New York is actually out of control. It, like our School River Path, is too crowded. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like being online for three miles. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that happening to, uh, to us yet <laughs> for, for quite a while, but um, I think it would help redevelop some of the um, loft buildings, the old factory buildings in that neighborhood, and I think it would be a great amenity. And some people have argued that it could, you know, it's pretty wide, and it could include a bike path, so it could actually not only be a park, but a kind of a, a commuting route. Um, so um, that would be great. There's a, another group, actually, who's discovered what's called the low line, which is if you, uh, right where the Inquirer building is, um, there's a, a submerged train line that's open to the sky that goes um, probably from like 36th Street to Broad Street, and some people want to connect that. And I mean, these are all big undertakings, and will take a lot of money, which the city hasn't doesn't have a lot of. But um, there is a plan to do this in phases, and um, the easiest phase is what's called the Septa Spur, because there's a little piece near the old Bagel Train on Broad Street um, that that slopes up to the main viaduct. That's owned by the city, it's about three quarters of a mile. There's a design to turn it into a park and it's pretty low cost relative to the whole thing. And I think it will happen in the next few years and then the hope is that um, people will love it and they'll want to donate a lot of money and um, uh, turn the whole viaduct into a park. Hi, I have two questions. First, what do you think of the Williams and Chen Barnes Foundation building? And secondly, do you know anything about plans for the former Divine Hotel? Um, I'll answer the first one, because uh, that's like pretty fast. So the Divine Lorraine f was sadly flipped and flipped and flipped between developers. The developer who had it now, got a ton of publicity when he bought it, but he has no money, he's in all kinds of financial trouble, and it, do, it doesn't look good right now for him developing it, unfortunately. So, because um, I think, I think he's, he's, he's in trouble. Um, I, wrote, I reviewed the, uh, the Barnes, and some, some people read, you know, it's always interesting. Some people read, read your reviews as being negative. Some people read it as positive. You know, it's like, are they reading the same story? I mean, it was mixed. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like people should just deal with that. Um, I, I love the building. I hate the site. Um, 
You know, it wasn't apparent to me, um, so maybe maybe it's unfair to criticize the people who organized this. Um, the site is way, way too small for that building and all the stuff going on there. That's the first thing. So it's really crammed onto the site, uh, which does the architecture no good. And then the architects, um, uh, to make the building work for everything that the, the barns wanted to do, they wanted to have a parking lot, they wanted to have a gigantic, ginormous um, port cocher bus drop off. And then of course they have to deal with trash like everyone else and that meant a, a big loading dock. Uh, by the time they put all that stuff on the site, um, the building is just strangled. Um, I don't th think the landscaping along the parkway is very good, although other parts of the landscaping I do like a lot. Uh, like the the approach along the side, especially when you see the granary through this, the the fir trees. I think it's a beautiful moment, and when you see the reflecting pool, that's all really beautiful. I think the building itself is exquisitely made. It's it's like you know somebody knitted you like a handmade sweater, you know your grandmother. You know it's so it's every every piece of that building feels like it was made by hand, handcrafted. It's you know, I think it's the best, you know, work of architecture in the city since the PSFS building, um, but compromised by these, by some of these problems, problems of the site not being big enough. And I think to have a surface parking lot in front of such a fine building <laughs> is just nuts. It's just an outrage. I mean, we need to learn to make our buildings more urban. Um, there's no reason that parking lot should be there. And some people say it will go away eventually. I hope so. Um, but I don't like the bus drop off or the, you know, the the huge driveway on 20th Street either. We have time for at most one or two more. If anybody <laughs> wants to uh, finish on up, anyone who hasn't asked a question, right here. Yeah, I, I was just thinking with the Schuylkill Boardwalk of why can't they limit bikes like on the High Line? There's no bikes, there's no skateboards, it's bad enough walking there. Yeah, well, I think the problem is that the path, you know, legitimately was seen as a bike path. Um, and it should be a bike path because it connects into a lot of other important bike paths. Um, I'm a biker, um, and... You know, I think bicyclists, you know, have to accept that there are some conditions that are not appropriate to bike in, um, and we all we all have to respect each other. I mean, I've seen, you know, you see pedestrians wandering all over the pass. As, as you know, there's two lanes actually, north and south, and you see pedestrians who who don't stay on their side as if you know there was nobody else there. So you know, we all have to behave. Um, and res and be respectful of each other, and um, I think that's what we're going to have to do on the board boardwalk because I don't think it's going to be safe to you know, except you know at midnight maybe to be <laughs> whizzing whizzing along there. Uh, well, I guess that's. Uh, I guess. Do you want to take the last question? Did you did you have one more? Uh, the this is it. House House. Next mm -hmm. to the Athenaeum, I'm curious on Washington Square, given the history of that. Well, there was a big plan. I mean, there's a developer who, I don't know if he ever proposed tearing it down, but there was a proposal for like a 10-story tower, 15-story tower in the backyard, uh, which would the house would have been used as like the entrance to the tower or maybe, you know, had some kind of amenities for the tower. Um, and it was a big battle in the courts because the house is designated as historic and it was felt that the tower compromised it too much. Um, so, you know, it's gone on for a long time. I can't remember the latest uh, legal maneuver. Um, I think I think the develop a the developer might have lost in court, and then b the recession hit. No one's building condos right now, and I think someone else will come up with another plan. I think also the neighborhood. The neighborhood used the historic designation to fight the height, but maybe as people get more used to tall buildings, they'll be more accepting of, of that. Um, 
the people who live next door in the Lippincott building f fought it tooth and nail because it would have blocked some of their windows. So that's always a problem in the city, you know. Everybody has an interest, uh, and they want to protect their interest. Let me finish with just a quick two-part question, and, then we'll, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, and these Actually, the questions are kind of intertwined, perhaps. Um, are you optimistic, aesthetically or otherwise, about how the city is going and all the in your subject area, and how long do you think you're going to stay at doing what you're doing? <laughs> oh, that, that part's hard. Um, I'm I'm usually well. I shouldn't. I'm, I'm I'm pretty optimistic about the city. I mean, I think we are living in an incredible, incredible time in, for cities in America. Certain cities, in general, you know, who would have thought that Philadelphia would have had a population gain in the last census? It's an amazing, amazing turnaround. And when you see the amount of construction, housing construction, and the repopulation of neighborhoods, I feel like it. I feel like it happened like when I wasn't looking, um, whole neighborhoods that when I first came to the city in um, 1985, you know, places I would never walk, you know, are now really wonderful, desirable neighborhoods. Um, so much so that I think we have to worry about gentrification displacing um, a lot of less affluent people. Uh, but I, I just think, um, the amount of the city that has been stabilized with new population, uh, new businesses, it's, it's incredible. This city is really doing well. The thing that I'm very concerned about are the schools because, um, and I was, I was just at a, just by chance, I went to a wedding on, uh, over the weekend, and at my table were two, peop two, two couples who live in graduate hospital neighborhood with young kids, and you know they want to stay in the city, they have their kids in public school. They're deeply involved in those public schools. They have to do everything. They have to raise money for the libraries, for a for lunch aids, you know. And and that's going to take. And they're working people, and that's going to take their a toll on them. So I really, I really, we cannot be a real city uh, with just childless people. You know, to be a, a real working, living place, we have to have all kinds of people, people with kids, people without kids, you know, gay people, straight people, old people, young people, rich people, poor people. If we want that kind of richly textured diversity, we have to do something about the schools. And um, I don't see that happening. So I'm really worried about that. And. Also, I feel like it's the right thing to do for, for our economy, for social justice reasons, all the reasons. So, you know, I worry, you know, could the city's recovery be sidetracked by the problem with the schools? And then the other question was about... How oh, long do you oh, think you're going to be on the oh, job? Oh, I, hope, I hope to get a paycheck next week. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't know. Things aren't looking good at the Inquirer. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody here came tonight because you care about our city, and I know you all came because you appreciate Inga's work. So let's give her one last send-off. Thank you. And thank you all for staying all the way through. Appreciate it. And thank you for coming. <laughs>